Um, I'm Todd Harrison, uh, and thank you all for coming out to CSBA uh, today on this cold fall day. Uh, a few notes before we begin. We are broadcasting this live over the web, so anything you say uh, will be heard and will be broadcast and be used against you, uh, myself included. Uh, and it will be archived up on our website if you want to consult back to it in the future. Um, the report and the slides I'm about to go through are up on our website as well. Uh, so if people who are watching online uh, want to uh, go and download those, they're, they're free to do that now. Um, and I think that's all I was supposed to remind everyone uh, about. Um, so I'll get started. Uh, I've got some slides to go through here. Uh, and as I go through, please feel free to interrupt with questions as I go. Uh, in some places, I may go a little faster because it's things that uh, I have briefed to you, uh, to many of you uh, in the past you should be familiar with. But uh, if something's not clear uh, as I go through, please feel free to raise your hand uh, and ask. And then I'll reserve time at the end uh, for just open Q&A with everyone. Um, so, you know, the title of this report, Chaos and Uncertainty, uh, of course, the picture of the Capitol there, not so subtle. Uh, uh, this is a very chaotic time for the defense budget. Uh, and, uh, on my first slide here, uh, I just go through and just recap quickly what's happened in the past few years. Uh, the blue bars you see here are what the president requested in the base defense budget, so not including war funding here. Uh, and the red bars what was actually appropriated uh, and, and uh, executed uh, by Congress. Uh, so you see in FY11, Congress uh, cut the defense budget request by about $21 billion. So $21 billion less than the president requested. Uh, the next year, in fiscal year 12, they cut about $23 billion from the president's request. And then, of course, in 2013, sequestration went into effect, cutting about $37 billion uh, from what the Pentagon was planning uh, to get. Now, here we are in fiscal year 14. Because of the deal that uh, Congress struck that reopened the government, through January 15th, we're under continuing resolution. That is at the same level of funding as last year after the sequester. So that's about $596 billion, plus or minus a billion. Uh, kind of hard to calculate these things exactly uh, until we get more data out of DOD. Uh, so that $496 billion level that we're currently at for this fiscal year under the CR, that's about $31 billion less than the Pentagon requested for FY14. And the sequestration budget cap uh, that's lingering out there, and that'll take effect on January 15th unless Congress does something to stop it, uh, that budget cap is about $475 billion for DOD. Uh, and so that would be a cut of about $21 billion from the level they're at currently on the CR. So you hear a lot of numbers floating around. Sequestration, would it cut $50 billion out of the defense budget or $20 billion? Well, they're both right. They're just using different baselines. It's a $21 billion cut from the current level of funding. It's about a $52 billion cut from what the Pentagon requested for FY14. So that's the difference. Uh, so both answers are right, but you just need to be aware of what baseline people are comparing to. Now, what happened in FY13? Uh, a little background here that I think is instructive uh, for looking forward. So first of all, uh, sequestration, uh, as you know, I've been up here telling you for the past couple of years, uh, it's uniform uh, cut across all applicable accounts, uh, but there were exceptions. Uh, and these exceptions turned out to be uh, very significant in FY13. So first of all, military personnel accounts were exempted uh, from the sequester cuts. The president has the authority to do that. Uh, he exercised that authority and fully exempted military personnel accounts in FY13. Uh, as a note, the president has already notified Congress he will exempt military personnel accounts again in FY14 uh, should sequester take place. Now, all the other accounts were still subject to sequestration, but there were other uh, various exceptions and exemptions uh, that meant you did not end up with a uh, uniform percentage across all of these accounts, as you can see from the red bars in this graph. Uh, one of the uh, and most important of these exemptions was the, something called the crediting provision. And basically what that said, uh, to try to boil it down, is that if a particular program, project, or activity was being cut already from its FY12 level of funding to the FY13 level of funding by as much or more than sequester would have cut it, then it did not have to be cut anymore by the sequester. Uh, so that meant that the sequester cut was less 
uh, for those accounts because you know if they were already being cut by more than sequester, then they didn't get any additional cut. Uh, so that reduced the amount uh, of cuts in many of these accounts. And that's why you see the unevenness here uh, of how the sequester ended up being applied. Now, that crediting provision, important thing to remember here, is that only applied to the FY13 sequester. That will not apply in FY14 and beyond if we have another sequester. The same uniform across the board cut applies under the sequester, but you won't have that crediting provision to reduce the impact. The other thing that reduced the impact uh, of the FY13 sequester was that DOD has the flexibility to use prior year unobligated funds. So in layman's terms, uh, prior year unobligated funds are basically money that was allocated in a previous budget year that is left over that DOD still has the authority to spend, but they just have not put it on a contract yet uh, to actually uh, execute it. Uh, so within each program project and activity, uh, program managers have the discretion to figure out what money are they going to cut? Are they going to cut current year money, FY13 money, or old money that's still left over? Well, the chart you see here on the right-hand side, the green bar is the uh, unobligated funds as a percent of the total funds subject to sequestration in each of these major accounts. The blue bar is the percent of the sequester cut that came from un unobligated funds. So when the blue bar is higher than the green bar, that means that those accounts took a disproportionate share of their cuts from unobligated funds. They cut unobligated funds more as a percentage than they represented of the total funds available. You see procurement and RDT&E programs stand out. Uh, they disproportionately cut from their prior year unobligated funds. So what that means in terms of impacts is that uh, you know, procurement programs and RDT&E programs did not show as much of an immediate impact in FY13. Now, DOD will still be able to do have this discretion in the future, in FY14, but because they cut disproportionately from unobligated funds this year, they will not have as many unobligated funds going into next year as they otherwise would have had, so there won't be as much of a cushion. Uh, it's not that this goes away, it's just that they will not be able to utilize it as much because there won't be as many unobligated funds available. Now, the last thing uh, that uh, dampens some of the impact from the FY13 sequester uh, is reprogramming. Uh, and this is where Congress came back after the sequester took effect and gave DOD about a $9 billion uh, limit on reprogramming funds. Uh, and so basically reprogramming just means you can move money between accounts. So after sequester went across and cut everything, except MILPERS, uh, DOD then submitted a request to Congress and said, well, you know, you've given us the authority to move money around. Here's how we'd like to move it around. And so I went in and analyzed that to see when DOD was given that flexibility, how did they use it? Uh, and so what we found is, first of all, there was a significant, uh, the green bars represent uh, uh, increases in funding from the reprogramming, and the red uh, indicate decreases. And so they, in total, they balance out. You know, wherever you cut, you move that money and you increase some other account. So there was a net decrease in military personnel accounts. Uh, why did they do that? Well, most of that came from the Army. The Army was able to reduce in strength faster than projected, so they were going to have leftover money in their military personnel accounts to the tune of about $2 billion. So they moved that money uh, to help pay other bills. Uh, but you also notice under procurement and RDT&E accounts, there was a net reduction. Uh, and there was a net increase in your O&M accounts, operations and maintenance. Uh, so what that means is that when DOD was given the flexibility, they cut additional funds from procurement and RDT and accounts. Those are modernization accounts that pay for new technology and, and weapon systems, equipment uh, for the troops for the future. And they instead shifted that money into operation and maintenance accounts uh, to fund near-term operational needs, things like readiness, training, maintenance. Uh, and much of this was to cover war-related costs, so operations uh, in uh, Afghanistan in particular. So this is a good uh, indicator of in the future, if we have another sequester in FY14 and Congress gives DOD flexibility, what are they likely to do? We're likely to see them cut per, uh, procurement and RDT&E accounts proportionately more so that they do not have to uh, cut O&M accounts as much. Uh, the other thing on the right-hand side, I thought it was just interesting to look at the reprogramming re request by service. Uh, and for, most, for the most part, the services basically rebalanced within their own uh, part of the budget. Except for the Navy, uh, they actually cut more than they increased. So where did that money go? 
uh, well, the Army increased more than they cut. So essentially, this was a transfer uh, of funds, about a billion dollars from the Navy to the Army. I don't know if they, they would be willing to do that again. We'll see. <laughs> sure. Um, all right, so here we are right now. Um, part of the deal that reopened the government, um, you know, they passed a continuing resolution. Uh, so basically, it keeps us funded till January 15th. If they don't extend it by then, then we'll have another shutdown. Uh, they extended the debt ceiling a little further. Uh, and they also agreed to go to a conference committee for the budget resolution. So uh, back in the spring, I think in April, uh, the House and the Senate each passed budget resolutions. Now, that had not happened in the Senate for several years, uh, but that was part of the deal to extend the debt ceiling uh, back in the spring. So uh, they passed their budget resolutions, uh, and now they're supposed to go to conference committee to work out the differences. So I took a look, and in the budget resolutions, um, and keep in mind, these are not appropriations bills. Even if they come to an agreement on this and sign it into law, this does not give anyone in government the power to spend money. This does not avert a government shutdown. It doesn't change sequester. This is just a blueprint of where they intend to go in their appropriations bills. So uh, budget resolutions are just a blueprint. Uh, but it's interesting to see uh, what they're proposing. In the budget resolutions, they do not get down into a level of detail and specifying what to cut and what to keep. Uh, the lowest level of detail they get into for defense is what they call the 050 budget function. That's total national defense funding. About 95.5% of that is DOD, but there is a little more money in there for things like nuclear weapons programs funded through the Department of Energy, uh, a little bit of Homeland Security, and some other things. So I looked at this and I said, okay, well, let's, let's compare the budget resolutions for that national defense budget function. The black line you see here uh, is what has actually been funded in previous years. This is adjusted for inflation to today's dollars. Uh, and then the green line are the budget caps that are currently in effect uh, from the Budget Control Act. So some people call this sequester level funding. So that's what you see there. That's what the budget caps uh, put the limit on. Um, so here's the House budget resolution. On the dashed red line you see there, so they say, hey, we're going to bring defense spending back up to where it would have been without the sequester, and then we'll grow a little in the future. Here's the Senate budget resolution. They say, also, let's bring the defense budget back up, and then we'll decline gradually over the next decade. And the president's budget basically threads the needle in between the two. Uh, I love to point out to people that there's really hardly any difference at all in their FY12 level of funding. It's a tiny difference. Uh, you can't even see it on the chart. So what's the problem? Why, if the you know budget uh, conference committee uh, they go through and negotiate, and you know, they should be able to agree on this level of defense spending, right? Well, the problem is what's in the rest of their budget resolutions, and that's the problem we've had all along: is that this budget battle is not about defense. It's about all the other things in their budget resolutions. It's about taxes, revenues. Uh, it's about entitlement programs such as Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Uh, the level of funding for those programs in the future and the level of benefits provided. Uh, and it's about non-defense discretionary spending. So, and you know, they all you know increase defense spending back up to the pre-sequester level for FY14. The Democrats and the president do it through a combination of increased revenues um, and you know and other provisions in the law. The president's budget even has some some slight changes to uh, entitlement programs, changing the, the CPI the way that's calculated. Uh, the House budget resolution restores defense funding, uh, but it does it without any new revenues. They don't want that. Uh, they do it by other spending cuts in entitlement programs like Medicaid uh, and in non-defense discretionary programs. Uh, so here we are again. This is the same impasse that we've been at since before the Budget Control Act was enacted. That's why we had the BCA enacted is because they could not come to an agreement on these issues. They enacted the BCA with these mandatory sequester cuts. Uh, as a backup in case they couldn't reach an agreement, and they created the super committee to actually go out and have some superpowers and try to forge an agreement. Super committee didn't do it, they failed. Um, so, with that in mind, I'm not that confident that this budget conference committee is going to be successful uh, in bridging this divide uh, or this impasse that we've had uh, going on almost three years now. All right, so. With that in mind, uh, the FY, uh, well, let me back up here. So you see here the president's level of funding for FY14, again, assumes there's no sequester. It's about $52 billion <laughs> over the budget cap for DOD. Uh, so 
you know, with that in mind, with sequester still being the law of the land, uh, is it really that useful to look at the FY14 request and look at all the details and how they fund all the different programs and projects and activities when we all know that there's a sequester cut looming and it doesn't seem likely that Congress is going to be able to avoid it? Well, I took a look anyway, uh, and I think it is useful to still look at it uh, to see what are the big issues. And if they do have to cut another $52 billion out of the budget, uh, what are the problems going to be? So let's look at it in a little more detail. I'll start with your military <coughs> personnel related cost in the budget. Uh, so an FY14 budget request, uh, the colored sections of the pie that you see on the left hand side here, those are military personnel related costs in the DOD budget. They total $177 billion. Uh, the largest component of that is basic pay, $52 billion. That's the primary form of cash compensation that service members receive. The next largest share is the Defense Health Program that funds TRICARE. Uh, that's health care for active duty service members, uh, their dependents, retirees under the age of 65, and their dependents. Uh, allowances, uh, $28 billion there. That, uh, these allowances are for uh, you know, housing and subsistence. It's basically cash compensation that goes to troops, but uh, it, it is separate because it's for these particular uh, items. Uh, guard and reserve pay, $20 billion. Retired pay accrual, that is how much DOD must set aside each year uh, to fund the future expected benefits, uh, retirement benefits of those currently serving. That's about $17 billion in this budget. And just keep in mind, that's about 33 cents of every dollar of basic pay that DOD has to set aside to pay future expected retirement benefits. And only about 17% of the force will actually retire. They're setting aside 33% of basic pay for everyone only 17% of the people are ever going to receive those benefits. So it's a, you know, a large set aside. I would love uh, for my employer to set aside 33% of my pay for my retirement plan. Uh, and especially then have, you know, 80% of the other people not receive it and the rest of that go to me. That would be a great deal. Uh, but that is what uh, the retirement pension plan uh, that we currently offer uh, requires. Yes, sir. What is the total number for FY14 military personnel related requests? Total for all of this that you see here, DOD and non-DOD, is $412 billion and counting. Uh, and I'll point out later some things that aren't included in that. Um, Todd, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah. On, on the, the non-DOD budget side, we've also got treasury payments and military retirement. How's that related to the 33%? Glad you asked. So that other side of the budget here, you see $235 billion. Those are additional military personnel related costs. So these are costs as a consequence of having people serve in the military that are outside the defense budget. So I'll break it down. The first, uh, the, the major component of that you see there on the right hand side, treasury payments to the military retirement trust. What is that for? That is an additional payment the treasury has to make every year to the military retirement trust fund to cover unfunded liabilities in the trust fund from prior years. So what has happened is in prior years, this Retired pay accrual has not been enough. And so we've built up an unfunded liability uh, in this retirement trust fund. We know that in the future we're going to have to pay out more in benefits than we set aside. And so that additional payment to fund that unfunded liability comes directly out of the Treasury. It does not come out of the defense budget. And this year it's $70 billion. It will be a little higher in future years uh, if you look at the projections of this. How did we end up with such a large unfunded liability? Well, I can tell you one big reason uh, is redux. So back in 1986, uh, Congress changed the retirement system for DOD. And you know the old system uh, was that after 20 years of service, you get 50% of your pay for life, uh, and it increases the longer you stay. Well, in 1986, they said, well, that's too expensive. We're going to change it to 40%. Uh, so after 20 years of service, you get 40% of your pay for life. Um, well. They, they grandfathered everyone in, and they said this will only take effect, this new system will only apply to people who join the military after the date this is enacted. So that meant that the soonest anyone could retire under that new system would have been 2006, 20 years later. Well, around 2001, uh, people who were in that cohort started complaining and said, hey, this is not fair. Just because we joined a year later than someone, we have a drastically reduced retirement benefit. How is this fair? How is this equitable? Congress agreed with them, they changed it back. And so now they went back to 50% of retirement, 50% uh, of your pay in retirement. What that meant though is that for that intervening period of 15 years roughly, DOD had not been setting aside enough 
money in the retired pay accrual because they thought the benefit in the future for these people was going to be less. Congress went back and changed it, though, so now these people were going to get a higher payout in the future. DOD hadn't set aside enough money, so now we had an unfunded liability in the retirement trust fund. Yes. Um, so going on from that, what's the income security for veterans and where did that come from? All right, let me work my way down. So okay. ne yeah. Next item here, tax exemptions for military personnel. So you, uh, you serve in the military, you get tax exemptions. Obviously, if you're deployed to a combat zone, you get a tax exemption for that. Uh, but also, even if you're not deployed, your allowances for housing and subsistence are not taxed. Uh, those tax exemptions add up to $15 billion in lost revenue for the Treasury each year. Um, so that's a tax expenditure. The next item here, veterans, hospital, and medical care. That's through the VA, funded through the Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, that is hospital care for people who qualify, veterans who qualify um, for that, uh, that medical care. That is different than the military health care system. Uh, so the military health care system uh, serves people who are currently in the military. The veterans health care system serves people who are no longer in the military. Um, now, you, know, you could, as a military retiree, potentially qualify for both, um, but a lot of the, the people that the Veterans Administration serves are not military retirees. They're people who were <coughs> injured or disabled on the line of duty, and they now qualify uh, for that medical care uh, as a veteran. Uh, now, income security for veterans, $72 billion in the budget request. Uh, those are things like disability pension payments for veterans. Uh, and these two costs, hospital care uh, and income security for veterans, have grown significantly during the Obama administration uh, because they have expanded who qualifies for these benefits to cover more, peop more people. Uh, you've got $7 billion in other benefits and services, various things. The bottom line here in purple, uh, veterans education, training, and rehabilitation, that funds things like the GI Bill. Uh, so the GI Bill is a great educational benefit people in the military receive. <coughs> They've expanded that. The post-9-11 GI Bill now uh, is transferable. So it used to be if you served in the military, you earned uh, credits that you could then go once you leave the military uh, and use that to go to school and get uh, a higher education. Now the, that benefit is transferable to your spouse or your children. Uh, and so it's more usable. It's also more expensive uh, for the government to provide. Uh, and so that, again, is not funded in the DOD budget that is funded to the Department of Veterans Affairs. So as you can see, military personnel related costs are a big driver of the overall federal budget. 412 billion, uh, that is a significant piece of the overall federal budget. Uh, I put it together this way because a lot of times people you know, miss out on it. They think that just the DOD uh, portion of military personnel cost uh, is the total cost, but really there are a lot of other costs in the overall federal budget. Uh, and right now, uh, Congress has created a commission uh, to look at this, uh, and they have been given the purview to look at the full uh, spectrum of military personnel-related costs and come back with a package of compensation reforms. Uh, and so they are working on that now. Uh, they're going to finish sometime this spring or this summer and report back to Congress. The one problem with this is that Congress uh, took out the provision of that law that would require uh, Congress to vote on what the commission recommends. Uh, so the commission can do great work, come up with a great package of reforms, uh, and Congress may just sit on it and ignore it. Um, so one of the things, you know, when we had the, um, we put together the uh, Defense Reform uh, Coalition earlier this spring uh, and got, you know, 25 different um, scholars at 10 different think tanks to sign on to a letter. One of the specific things we recommended is that Congress go ahead and agree to give whatever the commission proposes an up or down vote for both chambers. They should go ahead and agree that they're going to do that. Uh, and so hopefully that's something they will get around to. All right, next big item in the budget is they requested another round of base closures, BRAC, uh, Base Realignment and Closure uh, Commission. Uh, we've had five previous rounds of BRAC, so I went and took a look uh, at the costs and the savings from implementing each of these BRACs. Now keep in mind, the savings are not the total savings from the BRAC. They're just the savings that accrued during the implementation period. So the savings are in green, uh, the costs are in red. Uh, so you can see that the, the fifth BRAC, the, the most recent round of base closures, was by far the largest BRAC uh, we have ever had. Uh, the cost of that BRAC was more than all previous BRACs combined. This was a huge BRAC, uh, and this has left a sour taste in the mouth of many in Congress. 
because it cost much more than it was projected to cost, and the savings were a lot less. The immediate savings during implementation were a lot less uh, than they were projected to be. Now, this BRAC still will break even. Uh, we should be hitting the break even point sometime around 2015, where the total savings uh, accrued up to that point uh, will offset the upfront cost of that BRAC. But that's a long time to wait uh, for the savings to balance out the cost. Uh, now, DOD proposed another BRAC uh, in this budget request. They proposed one last year. Congress shot it down. Congress is in the process of shooting down this BRAC. Um, so I'm not confident that'll happen. But DOD did put more details in the BRAC proposal this year. Uh, they actually uh, put a funding wedge in there for it because closing bases will save you money, but it costs you money first. And they actually put a funding wedge in there of $2.4 billion over the FIDEP, over the five-year plan, uh, to fund the initial part of that BRAC, it would likely cost another two or three billion beyond that. Uh, and they gave us some indication of what they want to do. So keep in mind, you know, a, a five billion dollar or so BRAC on this graph would be pretty small. This would be closer to the uh, BRAC one or BRAC two uh, in terms of size. Uh, and this BRAC would be fundamentally different because what DOD wants to do is actually close installations. In BRAC five, the most recent one, um, they actually did not do that many closures, they did more realignments. That's expensive. So when you close a facility one place, move all of those people, uh, and then build a brand new facility for them somewhere else, uh, and get that all set up, that actually costs you a lot of money, tearing down the old building and building a brand new one. That's not what they're proposing this time. They're pro proposing just closing things that are underutilized. Uh, and they think that they could actually, by doing that, they could eliminate about 26,000 DOD civilian positions. Uh, that alone, uh, just the savings from elim eliminating those positions once fully implemented, would save you around $2.5 billion per year. Uh, so, you know, we're talking an upfront cost of, you know, maybe $5 billion in total, uh, and then annual recurring savings once fully implemented of about $2.5 billion a year. Uh, that would pay for itself pretty quickly. Uh, so this is a fundamentally different BRAC proposal. Um, the challenge, though, I mean, besides the political challenge here, obviously, pe members of Congress don't want bases closed in their own district. They don't want any of those 26,000 jobs eliminated from their own district. Uh, and inevitably, it's going to have to be in someone's district. But if you just set aside the political challenges with doing a BRAC, um, you know, the big challenge right now is that because of the budget caps, in effect, DOD needs savings immediately. They can't wait two, three, four years for the savings start to start to accumulate. That makes it more difficult to do a BRAC right now. Um, I still think that, that this is a good thing to do because you're preparing for the future uh, and it puts you in a much better position in the long run. And the sooner you do this, the sooner you can start accruing those savings uh, and invest those dollars elsewhere or limit the cuts and other things. Um, but it, you know the, the prospects for a BRAC right now do not look good. Uh, took a quick look at the procurement request. Uh, I'll just point out a few interesting things here. Obviously, the largest portion of the procurement uh, budget you can see here is going to aircraft, about $34 billion out of the total uh, procurement budget. If you break that aircraft procurement uh, line item out, about half of the aircraft procurement dollars go to the Navy. The Navy is spending more and buying more aircraft uh, than the Air Force. Uh, and this is actually not a new uh, situation. This has been happening for the past couple of years. Uh, so you can see the Navy's budget is about $18 billion in aircraft procurement. Air Force is spending about $10 billion. The largest aircraft procurement program in the Navy is the P-8. That's a modified 737 used for anti-submarine warfare. Uh, and of course the second largest would be the Joint Strike Fighter. Uh, the Air Force largest aircraft procurement program is the Joint Strike Fighter. When you combine those two Joint Strike Fighter funding lines, uh, you're talking a little over six billion dollars in procurement funds, just procurement funds for the Joint Strike Fighter in FY14. Uh, you can see we've got about 16 and a half billion in classified uh, procurement. That's not that different than in the past. Yeah, I thought in that classified wedge. Um a whole lot of that has traditionally popped up in the Air Force budget under selected activities. And there's always been an argument running about whether that's actually procurement or whether that's a, a bunch of funding just being dumped off into the IC somewhere. Yeah. Um, We've so had this argument for the last 20 years, 25 years. Yeah, so the vast <laughs> majority, you're right, the vast majority of that is uh, through the Air Force's budget. The other argument uh, you hear from the Air Force a lot is, hey, 
all you know, all of this classified funding is getting funneled through the Air Force, and it's not part of our blue Air Force budget. Mm -hmm. uh, so it actually has the effect of inflating the Air Force yeah. budget and make it look like the Air Force is getting more than it actually uh, receives. Um, it's a fair argument. Uh, I think, you know, if the money is actually passing through and not going to the Air Force, they should just put it in a defense-wide account. Mm -hmm. um, so it would be more transparent that way. Um, but, you know, they don't want to release those kind of details. Is that it's partly, it may be partly platforms, but it's mostly just a posture. Yeah, we'll yeah. never know. Yeah. <laughs> True. <laughs> um, and so you can see the other big parts uh, of the uh, procurement budget. Uh, ground systems, we are not spending that much procuring ground systems right now. This is, by the way, this is just in the base defense budget. In prior years, we were spending a lot on ground systems, but it was primarily funded uh, through the war-related funding, the ELCO request, uh, as we bought the MRAP, the mine-resistant ambush-protected vehicles. Now, what I like to look at is the ratio of procurement to rdt and &E spending. I think that that's interesting. So that basically tells us how much of our total uh, modernization funding is going to buying equipment, actually buying equipment in quantities, versus developing new weapon systems. Uh, and so I track this back to 1955, uh, and you can see the ratio here has hovered you know, around 2.5 or so uh, in the past, which means we're buying about two and a half, we're spending two and a half dollars on procurement for every dollar we spend in research and development. The gray shaded areas uh, show when the overall defense budget was in decline. So these are previous downturns. And so you see that ratio of procurement to rdt and &E funding has declined in previous downturns. So this is the downturn at the uh, drawdown of the Vietnam War. And the, uh, the next gray shaded section is a drawdown. Uh, sometimes we say at the end of the Cold War, but it started before the Cold War ended. Uh, so it's the end of the 80s buildup, uh, you, you might say. Yeah, because at, at, at those points, you have a lot of new kits. You come, for example, Air Force comes out of Vietnam with a whole bunch of relatively young Air Force right. and same sort of thing. Right, and during the 80s buildup, yeah. a lot of that buildup was in procurement. We bought a lot of new aircraft, all kinds of new systems. Uh, and so during the drawdown, we could cut back on that. Mm -hmm. um, but if you look at recent years, uh, especially since we started this drawdown, this drawdown started in 2010. That's when the budget mm -hmm. peaked, both the base budget and the war budget. And if you look at the drawdown that's happened since then, the ratio of procurement to RDT, t and &E has not followed that previous trend. Mm -hmm. The ratio has actually gone up. So that basically means that as the budget has come down, procurement has been cut at a faster rate than RDT and &E funding. Um, and so, I'm sorry, I got that backwards. RDT and &E funding has been cut at a greater rate than procurement funding, which has driven the ratio up. Uh, now, if it were, if we were to, you know, suddenly start following uh, trends in previous drawdowns, uh, that would mean that pretty quickly, uh, if that ratio starts declining from where it is now, it would pretty quickly go below one, which would mean we're actually spending more on developing new weapon systems than we are buying new weapon systems. Uh, and that would be the first time in modern history that we've done that. So I'll come back to this more of the trends uh, in previous drawdowns of what that might mean for the future. But a little, I thought this was a little interesting insight here. Uh, now, next item, <clears throat> war-related funding in 2014. So when DOD submitted the initial budget request for 2014, they did not include uh, a request for war-related funding. They followed up in May uh, with that request for war-related funding. And it was a bit of, of a shocker to me. Uh, in 2013, uh, DOD requested a $88.5 billion in war-related funding, uh, and we had a total number of troops deployed in Afghanistan, I think it was about 68,000 uh, in FY13. Uh, and that was consistent, roughly consistent, with previous requests, if you look at it on a cost-per-troop basis. So from FY08 to FY13, you can see in the blue bars here, the average cost per troop deployed in Afghanistan has been around 1.3 billion. Uh, average uh, 1.3 million uh, average cost per troop in Afghanistan. Uh, but the FY14 request came in at seven, 79 billion for Afghanistan, uh, and they estimate that the average number of deployed troops is going to come down by about 39 percent from the level it was in uh, 20 in 2013. So you've got a 39 percent reduction in the number of troops, but only about a 10 percent reduction in the level of funding. So that makes the cost per troop shoot up dramatically. Uh, now it's about $2.1 million per troop in Afghanistan, far more than we've been averaging in the past. Now, one of the, 
uh, explanations for this has been offered by DOD is, oh, well, the cost of drawing down forces. Uh, that's what you see here. You know, we've got all these added expenses of moving equipment out of Afghanistan, bringing all the troops home. These are one-time costs. Okay, that's great, but wasn't there a one-time cost of moving all those troops there to begin with and building all the bases and acquiring all of that new equipment? Uh, so you look back, and the green line here shows the uh, average force level in Afghanistan, and you can see when we had the surge, uh, FY09 to 10 and 11, we were adding large numbers of new troops in Afghanistan. We were building new bases. We were buying new vehicles for them, brand new vehicles, flying those vehicles over there to get there as quickly as possible, spending all kinds of money, uh, one-time expenses on these troops, and it did not affect the cost per troop. The cost per troop stayed roughly where it was, stayed steady over that time. Now, as we're drawing out troops, we're actually not bringing back all of that equipment. We're not bringing back the buildings. <laughs> you know, in some cases, we're tearing them down. In other cases, we're just handing them over or leaving them, uh, abandoning them. Uh, and a lot of the equipment we're not bringing back. Uh, you read stories now about these MRAP vehicles that aren't worth bringing back, and we're just dismantling them and selling them for, for scrap on the open market. We can't even give them to the Afghans. Um, so it, that, that explanation doesn't hold water to me. Uh, if there were all these one-time expenses of bringing troops back that's driving up the cost per troop, why didn't we see those one-time expenses when we were initially deploying them? Because in theory, those deployment expenses should be higher. Uh, so what explains the higher-than-expected uh, war request uh, for 2014? Well, another explanation offered uh, is that there are fixed costs. Not all of our costs in Afghanistan vary with the size of our forces. They may be dependent on other things, and I think there's some good reasoning to that. Um, so things like your intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, you're going to do just as much ISR whether you have 70,000 troops there or 40,000 troops there. Uh, that really is not going to vary with the size of the troops. Understand that. Uh, there are other things like our support for the Afghan forces. Uh, we're basically funding uh, their building of their army to the tune of about $7 billion a year right now. And that level of funding does not depend on the number of troops we have in Afghanistan. It should depend on the number of troops they have. Uh, so I understand that there are some fixed costs. So I plotted uh, the uh, annual budget authority for Afghanistan versus the number of deployed service members and drew a trend line here. And you can see in recent years in the upper right-hand side, FY10, 11, 12, and 13, they hold pretty close to that trend line, very close to it. But 2014 is still above it. But if you just extend that trend line out, when it crosses the Y axis here at about $20 billion, that implies that we have about a, a fixed cost of about $20 billion. So even if we went down to zero troops, we would still have about $20 billion in expenses, in theory. Uh, so I'll accept that. We've got about $20 billion of that $79 billion request for this year. About $20 billion of it is basically fixed costs that don't vary with the size of our force. But it still doesn't explain the FY14 data point it's still far above that trend line. It's about $20 billion above the trend line. So how do you explain the other $20 billion in cost? So then I went and looked deeper, broke it down service by service, account by account, uh, to try to see you know, how did things uh, uh, decline in this budget request. So look at the right-hand side. This is the percent change in each of these accounts from 2013 to the 2014 request. And keep in mind, the troops, number of troops is going down by 39% during this time period. So you see your military personnel costs, they decline around 30%. Eh, that's about what you would expect. Uh, but you get down to the O&M, and your Army operation and maintenance costs go up by 12%. So we have fewer troops, and their cost of operations are going up. The Air Force, same thing. Cost is going up. What could be going on here? Well, if you look at their uh, budget justification, uh, what do they define as these O&M costs in, uh, in war-related funding? It includes things like pre-deployment training. Well, there's a big gray area here. What do you, what do you classify as pre-deployment training versus your regular, everyday peacetime operations? There's inherently going to be some overlap between training people would have done anyway and the training that they're doing to deploy. So I think what's going on here is the Army and the Air Force are reclassifying more of their peacetime training operations as pre-deployment training so they can put it in the uh, OCO request. Why would you want to do that? Well, money that's in the OCO request doesn't count against the budget cap. So DOD's got a budget cap this year. 
of $475 billion, moving this $20 billion or so uh, out of their O&M accounts into war-related costs then frees up another $20 billion, or it prevents them from going over the budget cap by another $20 billion. So uh, there's a good reason to do it. Now, am I certain they're doing this? No, this is all circumstantial evidence. Um, but I think this points to the fact that some of our peacetime operations funding is actually being funded through the war budget. And I think there's a cautionary note here that if that is in fact what the military is doing, that means that their base defense budget cannot ad is not adequately funding peacetime training operations, peacetime readiness. So once this OCO money goes away at some point, they're going to have a problem in their base budget. They're going to have a gap of about $20 billion right now. Uh, it looks like they're going to have to fill if they want to maintain their uh, regular peacetime training operations. How are they going to do that? Well, if you want to fill that gap in a budget-capped environment, it's a zero-sum game. That money's got to come from somewhere else, and it would likely come from procurement and RDT&E accounts. So I think this is a cautionary thing to look for in the future years. Uh, you know, it looks like DOD's got a budget hole they're going to have to plug. You have a question? So you're saying the Budget Control Act, I mean, your theory is that the Budget Control Act led them to try to shift these training preparation costs put in the OCO account. Right, because it doesn't count against your budget cap. Did you see anything even before, I mean, back in 2006-07, before there was a Budget Control Act, was there a similar habit of, of the, the Bush administration putting yeah. that stuff a absolutely. Uh, there have been previous instances where there were things that, uh, particularly, I, one example comes to mind, the Army had a planned uh, upgrade of their communication systems, uh, WinT Increment 1A, I think they call it now. Uh, back then, I think they called it JNN, the Joint Network Node. It was a pre-planned upgrade that they had to their comm systems, uh, and all of a sudden, they switched to funding it uh, through war-related funding. Uh, and this was something that they were planning to do anyway. And then all of a sudden they were paying for it using war-related funds. So it, you know, begged the question: How is this suddenly war-related when you're going to do it anyway? So there have been some of this going on in the past. And actually, in the 2013 request, um, the Army and Marine Corps were pretty explicit about this. They moved uh, the cost of military personnel uh, that were excess to the level they were planning to draw down to. So for the Army, they're planning to draw down to 490,000 in the active Army. So anyone in excess of that they moved those personnel costs into the war budget. Uh, and they said, well, the only reason we're keeping these people in the interim is because we have these wars going on. Uh, and so that's how they justified it. So that extra military personnel cost that they had previously shifted is about $5 billion a year. Um, that that no purse that they are funding out of war funding now that they were not funding previously. That does not explain the increase we saw in 2014 because that no purse money was already there in 2013. So it doesn't explain the increase that we see. Uh, but that's another example of what, how they've been doing that in the past. Yes? If Army and Air Force O&M percents are up and the Navy is down 17%, how is DOD-wide down 21%? Yeah, I, I forget the details of what's going on in there in the defense-wide operations and maintenance. I think there's a good amount of classified funding in there as well. Um, but, you know, these are just your, your budget accounts by the major departments. Uh, so Navy here is the Department of Navy. It includes Marine Corps. Oh, yeah. All right. All right. So with that aside, setting the, four ten, the FY14 request details aside for a minute, and there's more detail uh, on that in the, the report that we're releasing. Uh, I'll also take a look in the report at historical trends in DOD funding. Uh, and so many of you have seen this chart before. I can't help but show it again. Uh, the solid blue uh, part here is the DOD budget uh, adjusted for inflation to today's dollars uh, over time. The gray shaded regions that you see are periods where the overall defense budget was declining. So these are our prior downturns. Uh, the Hashed, the blue hashed area on the right-hand side is OCO-related funding, so we can separate out the costs of wars in Afghanistan reasonably well, with the exception of some things that seem to have been funded uh, through OCO funding that probably should have been in the base budget because we would have been spending money on these things regardless of the wars. But as best we can, separating out the OCO funding. So you can see that in this budget cycle, uh, you know, with war funding included, we've gone well above uh, where we've been in previous budget cycles. This was a sharp increase. Uh, but if you just look at the base budget, we're actually pretty similar to the previous buildup, the 1980s buildup. 
uh, in the defense budget. <clears throat> now, the green line here uh, is active duty in strength. And so you can see in the Korean War, as the budget went up, you know, hostilities were initiated in Korea, uh, our end strength went up. We added a huge number of people uh, to the military, up to 3.6 million active duty. And then when the war came down, uh, the end strength came down. Uh, and then in Vietnam, as uh, hostilities picked up again, the budget went up, the number of personnel went up. At the end of Vietnam, the number of personnel went down. It went down lower than it was uh, before the conflict. Uh, and the budget went down as well. Now, the budget did not go down quite as much at the end of Vietnam in proportion to their drawdown of personnel because our people got more expensive then. That's when we transitioned to the all-volunteer force. So we had to start paying people more, so the cost per person went up. And then you see in the uh, 80s buildup, we did have a slight increase in end strength, but as I said before, uh, that buildup was mainly driven by procurement. We were buying a lot of new equipment at that time. But in the 80s drawdown, we did reduce the number of personnel, and we again reduced it by about a third uh, from where it was at the peak. And that was a very long drawdown. It lasted about 13 years. Uh, it didn't end until FY98. Uh, and then the most recent buildup, what is striking, uh, is that the number of personnel did not really increase. It stayed roughly flat. Now, the Army and Marine Corps got larger. They only got larger by 100,000, though. Uh, and at the same time, the Air Force and the Navy were reducing the number of personnel, so they really balanced out. So here we are at the peak of this buildup. We were at roughly the same level of end strength in the active duty as we were at the beginning of the buildup. So the budget went up, but the size of the force did not go up. Where did the money go? Uh, it's, it's hard to trace that. Even just looking at the base budget, it's hard to explain. Uh, we spent more on people, uh, we expanded uh, benefits programs, we enacted new benefits, we went back and changed things like Redux uh, for the retirement system. Congress uh, gave, deal, uh, gave members of the military extra pay raises on top of what uh, would normally have occurred. They gave an extra half a percent a year for about 10 years in a row, uh, and that has a, a compounding effect over time. So we ended up, the cost of our force uh, is much higher. And so that's why I say now we're at a point where uh, after, this, after this decade or so of increasing defense budgets, we have a, a military uh, that in many ways is smaller. We have fewer ships in the Navy. We have fewer airplanes in the Air Force. It's older. The average age of aircraft in the Air Force inventory is the oldest it's ever been. Uh, and it's just more expensive. We're smaller, older, and more expensive. So that is a different position to be starting a drawdown than in these previous uh historical periods. But, but you're saying that the traditional explanation of benefits in health care doesn't account for that? It, well, the traditional explanation, you mean the growth? Well, that people are more expensive now because of, because of the benefits and because health care is so much more expensive. That accounts for a good portion of it, but not all of it. We spent a lot more on acquisition programs as well, but if you look at the results, we didn't get more out of it. Um, part of this is because uh, a lot of our major uh, new acquisition programs, transformational programs, if you will, they were initiated at the start of the Bush administration. Uh, many of those major programs, we, we spent billions and billions on development, but they failed while they were still in development. Uh, and by my count, there were about a dozen major programs that failed over the past decade without producing a single item of equipment. Uh, and that totaled about $50 billion in development costs. Uh, so we spent a lot of money trying to start new programs and develop new systems, and we just didn't get things out of it. Uh, and other programs, while we did get some things out of them, uh, we didn't get as many as we were planning because of cost overruns. So, you know, the F-22 comes to mind. Uh, the program just ended up costing a lot more than expected, and instead of buying 700-plus F-22s, we stopped production at 187. Um, so we spent the money on the acquisition programs. We spent more money on them but we were not able to use that money effectively to recapitalize the force structure. Yes? But I, I presume that in any of the other buildups, we could also draw in the shaded line for OCO or supplemental or whatever they call it. it well, it, it's, it's hard to, uh, because this war, um, each year the request has been funded separately. It's been supplemental request each year. In previous conflicts, uh, we started with supplemental funding because, you know, if you're midway through the fiscal year, you didn't know you were going to have this war, so you have to submit a supplemental request. But we then quickly transitioned uh, into funding in the base budget. So in Vietnam, it was only a few years into it where DOD started putting the cost of the Vietnam conflict into their annual budget request, 
and the supplemental was only used for anything uh, in excess of what they had projected would be needed. Um, so it would be more difficult uh, to separate out what was the true war-related cost uh, of each of these conflicts. Um, if you're interested in that, uh, Steve Daggett, uh, the late Steve Daggett, the video you know, uh, he did great work on this at the Congressional Research Service in separating out, trying to figure out what was the real cost of each of these previous conflicts. Essentially, we've gotten more slippery in the past decade than we ever did before. Yeah. <laughs> what happens if you, what happens if you add the, you know, what's now the 250 billion in non-DOD personnel-related expenses? How do how much yeah. apocalyptically worse does this chart look at that point? Yeah, so if you were to layer on top of this, you know, your uh, budget for veterans benefits and services and your payments for the unfunded liability and the retirement trust fund and your tax exemptions, yeah, then this looks much more exponential. Um, I mean, I can give you one data point offhand. Uh, at the beginning of the Obama administration, uh, the total veterans budget uh, was $100 billion, roughly, uh, and now in the FY14 request, it's $150 billion. A fifty billion dollar increase in four years. Um, you know that's that's a big increase. What um, you mentioned the amounts are now smaller, older, more expensive. Mm -hmm. You may be getting to this point, um, but what would the effect of that be on the drawdown? Yeah, so that that's what I'm going to get to in the next slides. Is, is you know how could this drawdown be different? Or uh, kind of worst case scenario, I'm going to look at is what if it was similar to previous drawdowns? Given that we are starting at a very different point, what would that mean in the future? Uh, and I think that's what people in Pentagon should really be concerned about. Um, so I'll go, I'll go through quickly and look at trends uh, in prior drawdowns, uh, breaking it out by the major accounts in the budget. If you look at procurement, uh, and again, the gray shaded areas are when the overall defense budget was in a drawdown. The procurement budget, you can see, is highly cyclic, uh, and it actually correlates the best in time uh, with the overall defense budget. So when procurement budget peaks has been the same year that the overall defense budget has peaked. When procurement budget hits bottom, that's been the same year that the overall defense budget has hit bottom in the, pre in the past uh, three drawdown cycles. Uh, so you can see, you know, in the Korean War, procurement spending fell by 78% in three years. It's a huge decline. And this is all in constant dollars. These are all adjusted for inflation to today's dollars. Uh, Vietnam, uh, the procurement budget uh, fell by more than half. Uh, and after the 80s buildup, the procurement budget was cut by two-thirds. That's a significant uh, reduction. Now, you could do that in the 80s drawdown and in these previous drawdowns because in the buildup, we actually bought large numbers of equi equipment. The force got larger. So like at the end of the 80s buildup, for example, we had a lot of new aircraft. Uh, we had a lot of new tanks. We had a lot of new everything. And so you could cut back on procurement spending for a while because you had a relatively new modern force. Um, you can't do that. You can't cut back on it forever, but you could cut back for a while. Uh, well, in this buildup, I separated out uh, the solid line includes war funding. The dashed line is the base budget only. So if you look, there was a sharp increase in funding if you include war funding. What was that for? It was actually that spike you see on FY08 was driven by the MRAP procurement. We were buying huge numbers of vehicles in a short period of time. Now, is that something we can carry forward? Uh, you know, is the Army now fully modernized? Well, I don't think they would say that because these are vehicles, for example, the initial MRAPs that we bought uh, were for Iraq, and then when we pivoted and started focusing on the surge in Afghanistan, we realized we can't use those same vehicles that we built for Iraq and Afghanistan because the terrain was different. So we had to buy different MRAPs, MRAP ATVs, for Afghanistan because they had to operate off-road more. Uh, so these vehicles are very specific to the conflicts that we were in, uh, and as a result, we're not bringing many of them back. Uh, so a lot of this money that was war-related did not recapitalize the course. It bought things that were specific for these conflicts uh, and aren't going to be that useful going forward. Uh, UAVs is another good example. We bought a lot of uh, Predators and Reapers uh, UAVs. How useful are those going to be in our force structure going forward? If we're pivoting to the Pacific and we're you know, saying that we're going to need to operate in an anti-access area denial environment, that means operating in airspace that's defended where someone's trying to shoot you down, these aircraft aren't stealthy. Uh, they aren't relevant in that type of an environment. So how useful is this fleet of non-stealthy UAVs going to be in the future? We did spend a lot of money buying them, but is that the force that we need for the future? Um, 
So I think that is a difference uh, as we head into this drawdown. But also, look, the base budget for procurement actually didn't go up that much, uh, you know, compared to previous budget cycles. Uh, and so that is indicative of what I mentioned before. We had a number of new development programs that were started, but we didn't bring them to completion. Uh, things like future combat systems, things like transformational SATCOM, um, you know, Comanche, Crusader, you know, you can go through the list. A lot of programs that we were funding in development and then canceled. We didn't get anything out of it in terms of equipment. On the right-hand side, uh, the RDT&E budget, research, development, test, and evaluation, uh, it has a very distinctly different cycle uh, that we see, a pattern that we see from procurement. It looks more like a step function. So during the buildup, RDT&E funding rises, and the drawdown, it does not decline by as much as it increased. Oh, actually, I forgot to point something out here on the procurement side. Uh, when procurement budget decreased in the past two cycles, it bottomed out at $62 billion in today's dollars. This is an FY14 dollars. So the past two cycles have bottomed out at $62 billion. At the end of Korea, we actually dipped below that down to $50 billion. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind going forward. What if our defense, uh, if our procurement budget, again, bottomed out like it did in the past two cycles at $62 billion? That would be a reduction of a third from where we are right now in FY13 in the base budget. But back to RDT&E. Um, Interesting thing about RDT&E is we have already, in the three years of this drawdown, the RDT&E budget has already declined by 25%. That's as much or more uh, than it has declined in all three uh, previous cycles. Uh, so if historical trends were to hold true, we may be done cutting the RDT&E budget. It may have already uh, declined as much as it's going to decline. And also, I've plotted here the solid line includes war-related funding, the dashed uh, is base only, and you can see they're basically right on top of each other. Very little of our RDT&E funding over the past decade has been war related. Now, what about the other two big accounts within the DOD budget? Military personnel and operation and maintenance. Um, now, I do one budget thing here. Uh, the defense health program, health care, that's a personnel cost. It's actually under o and &M. I move it in my analysis uh, to be military personnel uh, related cost. And now you would expect uh, that as you add more people to your force, your personnel costs will go up because you got more people to pay, uh, and your O&M costs will go up because you have more people to support and train. Uh, so I, the best way to look at this is actually on a per person basis. So looking at your military personnel related costs per service member, adjusting for inflation, the interesting thing that we find here is that in previous drawdowns, gray shaded areas, personnel costs grew faster during the drawdown than the, during, they did during the buildup. So that's interesting. Uh, and you know, what if that happened again today? <laughs> uh, well, if you look on the right-hand side here, it doesn't look like it's going to happen again today. I think part of that uh, is that personnel costs grew so fast uh, over the past decade. I mean, if you look at the slope of that line, uh, that's about 4 to 5 percent real annual growth over the past decade, year after year, growing above inflation 4 to 5 percent. Um, it would be hard to grow faster than that in the future. I don't want to challenge Congress to do it, uh, but <laughs> you can only add so many benefits. I mean, once you've got completely free health care, how much more expensive could you possibly make it? I'm not trying to challenge them to dream up a way to make it more expensive, uh, but it would be really hard for these costs to accelerate in this downturn because they already grew so fast during the buildup. I think what is more likely is that we'll see the costs start to level off uh, War-related costs are already coming out. Um, War-related costs are extra deployment pay folks get for being uh, in Iraq or Afghanistan. That's going to come down naturally as troops come back from Iraq and Afghanistan. But in the base budget, we uh, at the peak, I think we we're paying about $5 billion a year in bonuses to keep people in, recruiting retention bonuses. That has already been cut in half. Uh, we're already paying less than half uh, of that recruiting and retention bonuses because we don't need as many people to stay in. We're actually reducing the size of the Army and the Marine Corps. Uh, so I think some of those costs will continue to come down. But the core cost, military personnel related costs in the DOD budget, that's all we're looking at here, uh, there are drivers within there that are going to keep them growing. Allowances for housing and subsistence, they consistently grow 2 or 3% above inflation. Uh, uh, you know, things like health care costs are driven, you know, even if Congress doesn't enact any new benefits. Um, Health care costs are growing faster than inflation, so I would expect that to continue in the future. So I think it's reasonable to think in this downturn we may see an average annual growth of about 2% a year above inflation. 
and the cost per person uh, in the military. Yes. So when you know ODNO is saying you know well we can't have a faster drawdown in end strength because um, because this would be you know this is not the bargain we made with our service members or as he would say war fighters. Um, when he's saying that at the same time we're still paying billions a year in recruitment and retention bonuses. Yeah, so some of those some of those retention bonuses are going to specialized career fields. Yeah. Like the Air Force mm -hmm. instituted a program to help retain fighter pilots because they're projecting they're going to have a shortage of fighter pilots. Although I'm not sure their projections take into account they're not going to have planes for them to sit in in the future if the budget keeps going the way it is. Uh, but nevertheless, they're paying. I think it's uh, it's twenty five thousand dollars a year for nine years uh, in, uh, in retention bonuses for fighter pilots. Um, yeah, so there, there's some of that going on, uh, but also uh, the Army, they say they can only reduce, I think, about 20,000 in in-strength per year mm -hmm. uh, without resorting to drastic measures like involuntary separations. Involuntary separations are when you kick someone out before their service commitment is up. Uh, and, you know, no one wants to do that, and that is kind of breaking the deal uh, with a service member. Right. Um, it, it happens, though. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Air Force... Uh, did that to a number of junior officers back in the middle of the past decade. Um, but, you know, I think the reality is that if the economy continues to improve, the Army will be able to reduce their headcount faster just by offering voluntary measures yeah. for people to get out. And in FY13, as I showed you before, they were able to reduce in strength faster than they projected. And it came down, their total personnel costs came down about $2 billion lower than they mm -hmm. thought it would be. Um, so, if the economy keeps improving, then I think that they could reduce in strength faster than they're projecting right now. Uh, and I think no one wants to resort to involuntary separations. And there's actually, when you do that, um, there, there's a cost in doing involuntary separations. It's not just a cost in morale uh, and breaking a deal, breaking a word, uh, but you know, often we give people a payment uh, to get them out uh, and get, their, get them on their feet when they leave. And there's unemployment costs uh, when people leave the military. Um, you know, DOD is paying the uh, unemployment costs for them if they don't get a job in the private sector. Um, but, you know, depending on economic conditions, they may be able to reduce industry faster than they're projecting. And that does save money. Um, on the right-hand side here, uh, your O&M cost per service member, uh, that actually has been on a pretty steady trajectory for decades now, growing at a real annual rate of about 2.8% a year. Fairly steady until we got to this buildup. You can see the war-related cost in the solid line there uh, grew dramatically faster. Why is that? And if you look at the base budget in the dashed line, it actually continued on that same steady trajectory. Um, well, part of it is war-related cost. A lot of it is in O and M, and these conflicts were different than previous conflicts. Um, this was the first major protracted uh, set of conflicts we had fought with an entirely all-volunteer force. Um, and so what that meant is uh, our people were more expensive, they're more valuable to us, and we did not, uh, we do not have a force now that is sized or structured uh, to do some of the functions that troops used to perform on the battlefield in the past. So we're using a lot more contractors uh, on the battlefield now, and those contingency contractors are funded out of O&M. Uh, and so that's what's making the cost per troop go up, is because we're paying in Afghanistan, uh, we've had just about as many contractors in Afghanistan as we have had troops deployed uh, during much of the conflict. Uh, and so the cost of those contractors is burdened here on the cost per troop, and that's why it's so much higher. We're using contractors now for things like laundry, food preparation, base support, and even security in some situations, but that actually is a small percentage of the contractor force. Uh, and so that is replacing troops on the battlefield. So in previous conflicts like Vietnam and Korea, uh, service members would have been performing some, if not all, uh, of those functions. Now it's contractors, so it's making the cost per troop go up. Uh, but those costs that are war-related are going to come down naturally. They've already come down 20% uh, so far in this drawdown uh, because we're pulling troops out of Iraq and Afghanistan. Once we finish the withdrawal, I expect those contingency contractor costs will be virtually gone and we'll be back on our steady trajectory of O&M. Uh, Todd, um, do you have any estimate as to how much more it cost to have the contractor workforce at one-to-one -to, -one to the troops uh, than it would have cost if the troops had been doing the functions that they used to do? 
I don't have a, co a cost estimate for that, um, a precise cost estimate, but I can tell you that anecdotally, anecdotally, if you look at some of the costs, depends on the function. Um, we were using contractors for you know, laundry and base support services and food preparation in the past, um, and the, I'm sorry, in Iraq and Afghanistan, and the specific contractors we were using, they often were not Americans. Uh, they're third-party nationals that we were hiring and bringing in from other countries. They weren't locals. They weren't Americans. They were others brought in from abroad. Uh, and you know, our military didn't have all that much control over it because we just would give a big contract to a firm, and they would go out and find the people. But as a result, they were paid a lot less than typical American wages. Um, they were paid whatever uh, a, you know, compelling wage was uh, in the country they're coming from, uh, which is typically much lower than U.S. Wa wages. So use of contractors in those circumstances, we can debate whether it's right or wrong to have contractors on the battlefield like that. But in those situations, it does save money because they're significantly less expensive for performing kind of routine service activities than using U.S. troops who now and you know, an all-volunteer force are much better compensated. Uh, I mean, our average cost per troop, and you can see here, it's now it's uh, over close to $130,000 when you count for all the pay and benefits and everything. This is just in the DOD budget. Keep in mind, I'm not including that other, you know, half of the cost that's outside the DOD budget. Um, so our our troops are pretty expensive, and so it's right that we keep our troops focused on things that are military unique. Uh, and where it's cost-effective to use a contractor uh, in the battlefield, uh, then you know it could be uh, a cost-effective solution to doing that. Now, in other cases, we're talking about security contractors. That's a different deal. Uh, a lot of cases we are using <coughs> former U.S. service members uh, for those functions, and they were being compensated highly in some situations, and so that does not necessarily um, make it cost-effective. And so, but that right-hand chart, you said that that number was burdened by the contractor workforce costs, is mm -hmm. that correct? Right. Yeah, the contractor costs are built in there, I mean, your cost per troop. That's why it's so much higher, because you've got contract. I mean, that's why you got contractors supporting <laughs> the troops, is yes. so you don't have as many troops. So, you know, take away from this, military uh, personnel cost per service member, I think it's not going to accelerate in this downturn, just because it had already accelerated in the buildup. So it's going to be different than previous drawdowns. But we should expect growth of about 2% a year. It could be less than that if we actually get compensation reform uh, passed. Uh, but we'll see about that. In your O&M cost per service member, I expect it will continue on a similar trajectory as it has in previous decades in the base budget, 2.8% real annual growth uh, in the future. Um, the other way of looking at this is uh, trends in the budget in previous downturns uh, by service, by military department. Uh, so breaking out here, uh, this actually disproves, this graph disproves one of the common myths you hear around the Pentagon often. Uh, and the, the common thing you hear is, oh, well, the services, they all get equal shares of the budget. They just split it a third, a third, a third. It's going to be hard to break that, you know, holy trinity or whatever you know, people want to call it. The services have never gotten equal shares of the budget. Never. <laughs> it's the myth. Never happened. Um, and, and even you know more to the point, they don't even get stable shares of the budget. Uh, if you look at this, coming out of the Korean drawdown, we had a, a, a shift in funding among the services. The Air Force came out on top. That was a period of you know Eisenhower's new look at defense, a, a big shift in defense strategy to rely more on uh, the threat of massive retaliation, uh, which meant we had to build up our strategic forces, which were overwhelmingly in the Air Force, strategic bombers, our ICBMs, etc. So the Air Force got the greatest share of the budget. At one point, the Air Force was getting almost half of the total defense budget. I'm sure they would like that to happen again today. Um, but the Air Force, uh, through this period from FY55 to 67, averaged 42% of the total defense budget. Well, then you go through Vietnam, and you come out of the Vietnam drawdown, and we have another shift uh, in the budget shares of the services. Now the Navy came out on top, and the Navy from FY72 to FY03, I think it's a 31-year period, 29 of those years, the Navy had the greatest share of the budget. They averaged 33% of the budget. Uh, and then, of course, if you look on the right-hand side, when more funding is included in the solid lines, the Army came out on top. I mean, obviously, this you know conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan were dominated by our ground forces, particularly the Army. So they got the largest share of the budget from 2003 forward. Uh, the other thing to note here, the reason the services don't get you know, equal shares of the budget, a third, a third, a third, is you've got defense-wide accounts. 
And those accounts, they used to be relatively small, but they've grown steadily over time. And even during previous drawdowns, your defense-wide accounts have grown. Now, there's an anomaly here I have to point out in fiscal year 91. That's because of the first Gulf War. Um, we saw a spike, you can see here, in Army uh, costs because of the war. Uh, but then we were reimbursed uh, for much of the expenses of that war. Uh, the reimbursement counts as negative budget authority and it went into a defense-wide account. So defense-wide accounts actually go negative uh, that year. So that's why you see it. That's the reimbursement going on. Um, yeah, I'd, lo I'd love to change it, but I don't want to alter the data. Uh, but the trend here is the same. Defense-wide accounts have been growing steadily over time. And even in the base defense budget, uh, you can see defense-wide accounts growing. We actually did have a significant amount of defense-wide funding. Uh, that was work-related, uh, primarily the uh, JAIDO, the Joint IED Defeat uh, Office, um, was part of that. But you know that funding is coming down already. So I think we should expect coming out of this downturn, whenever it ends, whether you know it's five years from now or ten years from now, uh, coming out of this downturn, uh, we should expect that we could see another uh, switch up uh, in which service on, is on top of the budget. The Air Force has had a turn, the Navy's had a turn, the Army's had a turn. Um, you know, I don't know if they're going to play musical chairs and just rotate again. Maybe defense-wide will be on top after this downturn. Who knows? Um, but we should expect that we'll see uh, a big shift in funding among the services. That's happened in all of our previous downturns. All right, so now uh, kind of the big takeaway from this, <laughs> from this report, I think, uh, for most of you, uh, is you look at what's going to happen in the future. Uh, going back to this chart again, except projecting out uh, until FY21, what's going to happen with the defense budget. The green, the solid green part that you see here on the right-hand side, uh, those are the budget caps currently in effect. These are the sequester level BCA budget caps. Uh, so if we stick with that, that's what the defense budget would look like. We'll hit bottom in FY14, and then it actually starts to grow. Those budget caps start to grow hereafter. The shaded area on the top is war-related funding, and I've just assumed a steady drawdown in Afghanistan in that green shaded area. Um, I don't know exactly what it'll be, but I, I feel confident by FY21 we will not have any war-related funding in a separate part of the budget, even if we have some permanent forces remaining in Afghanistan, although that's very uncertain. All right, so a lot of people are looking at this and thinking this is the floor in defense spending, but surely we'll do no worse than sequester. Uh, and a lot of people in the Pentagon are saying they think they can do better, even though they already got sequestered in FY13. Uh, and, you know, that $50 billion drop in annual funding, roughly $50 billion drop, they've already gone through $30 billion of it. So it's only another $20 billion before they hit the floor, and then FY15 and beyond, they'll start growing again. Uh, I look at this, and compared to previous budget cycles, this doesn't look right to me. Um, I think that the, the sequester level budget caps might actually be a ceiling not a floor for the defense budget in the coming years. So what could be a floor? Now, I'm not projecting that this is going to happen. I'm not predicting uh, it'll happen. But if you look at historical trends and then go through with those exceptions of why this downturn is fundamentally different and play them out, um, and let me walk you through quickly. So here I'm assuming the procurement budget falls to $62 billion again in today's dollars, as it has in the previous two drawdowns. So procurement comes down to $62 billion. RDT and E, I showed you, has already declined by as much or more than in previous drawdowns. So I assume RDT and E funding stays where it is at about 65 billion. Military uh, personnel costs, um, I assume that the cost per person grows at about 2%. Now that's less growth uh, than we've seen in previous drawdowns. But again, I don't think it can grow that much more because it grew so fast in the early part of this decade. Not assuming compensation reform there, just assuming Congress stops adding additional benefits. We should grow at about 2% per person. Uh, but the overall size of the force in previous drawdowns has declined by a third or more. We've cut in strength by a third or more in previous drawdowns. So I'm projecting here we would cut in strength again by a third. That means that we would go from about 1.5 million in the active duty force to 1 million. That would be the smallest active duty force we've had since 1940. But that would be consistent with drawdown and drawdowns uh, in personnel in previous downturns. And then O&M costs, I assume they continue growing at a rate of about 2.8% per year per person, but we have fewer people, right? We only have a million people, so overall total O&M costs would go down. Uh, you add all of that up and throw in another $10 billion for military construction and family housing, 
you end up with a base defense budget of about $415 billion in today's dollars. Uh, and assume the drawdown lasts till FY21, which is a typical length of drawdowns, uh, you know, given previous budget cycles. Uh, this is what it would look like if you draw down to a $415 billion defense budget, uh, you know, over the, the next uh, eight years or so. Uh, this is what it would look like, and then with the same assumptions in the decline in war funding. So this actually looks much more like prior drawdowns. Uh, now, I'm not project projecting or predicting that this is going to happen, but I think this might be a more likely floor for the defense budget uh, than the BCA budget caps that you see here. Yeah. I mean, isn't that still even a little bit generous because the historical trend of floors was somewhere It is, yeah. So if you look, if you kind of plot a line between the floors and each of these previous drawdowns, you know, the FY55, FY75, FY98, those floors, and you kind of draw that line out, um, we, we could actually go a little, you know, lower than $415 billion, but it's it's fairly close. $62 billion by when uh, Just by historical trend scenario, I'm not predicting this will happen, but $62 billion in procurement by FY21 is the assumption in this scenario. Now so that, that is a third that, million dollars less, basically. That's a third less. Million. Yeah, that's How's a third that less than we are today. Branching up the F-35. <laughs> yeah, how is that conceivable? I'll show you. Because we've done it in the past. We've actually reduced by more than that in the past. That's all I'm saying is it's a possibility because we've done that in the past. What would it mean for specific programs? It would mean they can't go forward. A lot of them can't go forward. Uh, and DOD would have to make some really hard decisions. I mean, if you're talking cutting the procurement budget by a third from where we are today, and it's already come down significantly in the drawdown, but if you cut another third, you know, you can't go forward with all of these programs. You're talking major cancellations. You're talking major delays in development programs, uh, significantly reduced buys. Uh, this would be, you know, catastrophic, if you will, for a lot of the procurement programs. It, there would be a lot of glass on the floor at the end of this. It would break a lot of things. What about the industrial base impact? The industrial base impact, I mean, I, I don't, I probably can't overstate uh, what it would mean for the industrial base. Uh, you would you would not be able to support the industrial base you have today. Uh, all the shipyards, all the aircraft production facilities, you just could not support it. Uh, industry would have to pull back. You would probably end up uh, with single vendors in many of the uh, sectors of your industrial base. Single vendors that can provide a certain capability. So then going forward in the future, you know, competition in many cases just wouldn't be an option. There would be no one that could, would compete, or if you did want competition, you would have to pay through the teeth uh, to build up uh, a contractor's industrial base so that they could compete with the incumbent. Argue the other side, is, if you be a lawyer and argue the other side, why it's virtually inconceivable that it would be cut by 30% over that if, if, if this were to happen, uh, this, let me go back to the chart here, this, uh, you know, more dire historical trend drawdown scenario. Uh, if this were to happen, um, what DOD and the skimmer talked about as a choice between capability, near-term capability, long-term, I'm sorry, near-term capacity and long-term capability, it would not be a choice. You would have to scale back on both. You could not have either uh, capacity or capability. You would have to cut back on both if you go back to this. Uh, and, you know, a total force of a million uh, in end strength um, that would be too small uh, for a number of contingencies. Uh, the pivot to the Pacific, uh, I don't see how it could happen on a drawdown that size uh, without you know, completely abandoning security commitments in other parts of the world. Uh, I mean, this would be a significant change. It would require a significant change in strategy and defense posture if we were to do this. Um, with all of that said, uh, this if you just step back and look at the chart, this is more consistent with historical trends than the BCA drawdown scenario that we're looking at now. So again, I don't think this will happen. Uh, I'm not projecting it'll happen. But if you want to look at a four, yeah, I'm not predicting it'll happen. I'm projecting out the scenario. Um, but if you want to look at a floor, I think this is a better floor to keep in mind. Uh, and the BCA drawdown scenario, by comparison, looks more like a ceiling. Um, you know, the idea that this drawdown would be over after four years, uh, that's inconsistent uh, with history on this. Yes, sir. 
And how much of the, when you say the, the historical trend scenario seems in some ways not feasible, how much of that is because of higher personnel costs? Because when you, I think if you were to save a lot of Americans, the average cost of compensation for a military service member is $130,000. They would be surprised at how high it is. Um, I mean, a good part of it is that, but the, if you don't reform compensation, the way you reduce your personnel costs is cutting people. And so in this drawdown scenario, I'm assuming a reduction of a third in the size of the force. So that's how you bring down your personnel costs under this scenario. That's how we've done it in the past. Uh, and that's why in the past, as we've cut our force structure by a third, our end strength by a third, um, that's really you know what was driving it because at the same time our cost per person was going up. It was accelerating in those drawdowns. Uh, so it's a big factor in it, and the fact that that military personnel are so more expensive now is going to limit DoD's choices in the future. Uh, because if you can't roll back those compensation costs, and politically it's going to be very difficult to do. If you can't do that in a budget capped environment, you have these really difficult choices. And I think if it were to go as low as this, you know, historical trans drawdown scenario, you would just have to cut back dramatically on the size of the force. And how much of, just roughly speaking, of the of the personnel costs, how much of that is being driven by increase in health care costs? Uh, I don't have the number off the top of my head. And in my projection scenario, I'm not breaking it out there into the different components of the cost. I'm assuming the total cost per person just grows. 2% above inflation year after year, um, but I could get back to you and look at you know how would that what would that mean for healthcare costs within it? I think you had your hand up. Uh, maybe the reason you mentioned the Pentagon people just looking at 2015 and from the Hill, the reason that might make sense is that um, they want a two-year. There seems to be some bipartisan consensus on doing a two-year sequester fix of some sort, and one idea that's bandied about is an idea of sort of doing. Uh, a halfway fix, maybe a hundred billion, half on defense, half on domestic. Everyone needs to spend a little bit more and get out of the budget caps a little bit. Um, a, I guess, what would be the impact of that? How much would that alleviate some of what you're talking about? Um, and B, um, another idea no one's talked about much is maybe redefining the firewalls, um, going back to security, non-security. Mm -hmm. um, that seems, you know, can vote on something like that. How much would that impact uh, this? So the only bipartisan consensus I've seen about uh, altering the sequester to lessen the impact on defense has been amongst people in the Armed Services Committees. <laughs> <laughs> amongst the broader uh, members of Congress, I don't think there is any kind of bipartisan consensus about that. Everyone's willing to say sequester's bad, uh, but how do you replace it? Uh, that's where they completely disagree. Uh, and Democrats aren't going to agree to reduce the defense sequester if they don't get Republicans to agree to reduce the non-defense part of sequester or increase revenues. Uh, and Republicans aren't going to agree uh, to those things if Democrats won't agree to entitlement cuts. And here we are again. We're back at the same budget impasse we've been at for you know going on three years now. Um, so I, I don't I don't see that necessarily working out in the next few months. But let's just pretend. If DOD got relief uh, from how if they had half sequester cuts in 14 and 15, I'll show you the way this graph would change is that the DOD budget <coughs> instead of declining by about 21 billion uh, in FY14 from its current level, it would go up. If they if they got half the sequester cuts uh, for 2014, that would be an increase from the level they're current currently at. So yeah, things would be a lot better. Uh, but again, the drawdown would be over, uh, and you know. Historically, uh, that's not how drawdowns have happened for us. <laughs> if we're talking about a one third, when you talk about that, the lower scenario having a, a one third reduction in end, end strength, I mean, it's not a one third reduction in budget. So if you try to stick with the BCA plan and you don't pull drawdowns beyond, you know, significantly beyond 1.5 million, um, then that would seem to indicate to me that you're going, you're still going to have a fairly horrible pinch on O&M and on, on readiness and procurement and R&D. Yeah. 
So now the, the third drawdown in end strength I was talking would be under this historical trend yeah. scenario, not the BCA caps. Right. Under the BCA caps, I think you're hitting the point uh, exactly right that even under these caps, you still have to make some tough trades between current capacity of the force and your long-term capabilities. Current capacity is end strength, it's readiness. Uh, you know, those are primarily military personnel and your O&M costs. And your long-term capability are things like procurement and RDT&E spending, which, you know, invest in new technology and buys new weapon systems that will help you 10, 15 years from now. And that is exactly the dichotomy that the, uh, the skimmer, the Strategic Choices and Management Review, presented to people. Uh, and they said, look, here's the, the big choice you would have to make. It's near-term capacity versus long-term capability. Um, now, as I wrote about in my foreign affairs article a few weeks ago, you know, it's not a strict dichotomy. It's not quite that simple, um, but that is a useful framework for thinking about this problem. So, in reality, this is a, a strategic choice you'd have to make. Uh, it's not a single choice. It is a choice you have to make. It's thousands of decisions within the defense budget, within the current program of record. Uh, and in each of those decisions, and they're not all made by DOD or their administration, Congress is, has a role in making these decisions as well. So you've got scores of people making all these decisions, thousands of decisions, and some of the decisions could go in opposite directions. But I think the big point is overall, which direction do all those decisions tend to point in? Do they tend to point towards reducing capability in the near term or towards reducing, uh, sorry, reducing capacity in the near term or reducing future capabilities? Uh, which way is our strategy going to lean? Yeah. I think the default approach right now uh, is they're going to tend to preserve near-term capacity as much as they can. If you hear the Army, if you hear General Odierno talking about it, he is pushing back, you know, mm -hmm. digging in his heels as much as he can about in-strength reductions. And, and he's readiness. even in readiness. And he's basically taking off the table uh, the idea that they could change their capabilities and have a, a different Army with different capabilities right. in the future. Mm -hmm. he is, Flat out said, that's not an option for us. Well, in reality, it is an option. Yeah. Um, you know, you could develop an army with different capabilities in the future, and you might not need as many people in the future. Oh, the idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but to do that, you have to take a near-term risk uh, in current capacity, mm -hmm. and they aren't willing to do that. And I think that that uh, is the more likely scenario: is that DoD uh, goes through this drawdown if it's just the BCA budget caps. They do everything they can to protect near-term readiness and to reduce or limit the reductions uh, in end strength in the near term. They're still going to have to make some reductions, but I think they'll try to do everything they can to limit that. Yeah. But what that means is yeah. those cuts are coming from somewhere. They're mm -hmm. coming out of procurement and RDT and yeah. funding. And you get into this sort of horrific sort of Professor Norton's revenge scenario where yeah. we're spending half of our half of our procurement money, half of our acquisition money. Is going into RDT&E. Yeah, They're just designing and, things. And Tony, back somewhere. to your point, that's how you can start to get closer to that 62 billion in procurement funding. Uh, is if you're trying to maintain a larger force, uh, how do you pay for it? You pay for it by cutting some. It's a zero-sum game under budget caps. The money's got to come from somewhere. Uh, you could, uh, you know, preserve a larger force if you cut procurement by more. The obviously the the downside of this is that you are basically taking a risk in the future because 10, 15 years from now, you're not going to have the modern equipment, the modern technology uh, that you would have otherwise had if you cut those investments now. Does, does redefining the security, non-security make much of a difference? Well, yeah. I mean, if you could lump it all together in one big budget cap between security and non-security, um, then it would be up to Congress how to appropriate the money, and then that would determine, if you still exceed the cap, how the cuts go out. So that would just lump everything in together. But again, I don't see Democrats being willing to do that outside the Armed Services Committees. Back there, you had a question. Um, so under your historical trends uh, scenario, is there anything that could reasonably cause that you know, to be from reality? Because even as recently as yesterday, you have Congressman Brister talking as if they're bounced into this, you know, one third, one third, one third spending for Army and Air Force and at sea post ration levels. I mean, could anything, anything push those back? I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe if the Tea Party takes the White House, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, things that could push you in this direction are if um, if people continue to see um, as you cut the defense budget, 
if they don't see the effects and more members of Congress start to think, hey, this is not so bad, maybe I can cut more and get away with it, and it's little by little, year after year, you know, you chip away at the defense budget. That's one way this can happen, and that has happened to a certain extent in previous drawdowns. Um, uh, you know, other ways it could happen is if we have significantly uh, reduced growth in the economy or if we hit another recession. Uh, that is going to put the squeeze on spending again. Um, that's always a possibility. Uh, now, reasons this wouldn't happen uh, are that, you know, you look at the end of the, uh, what, the, the 80s drawdown. Uh, granted, it, it, had, it started before uh, the Cold War actually ended, but if you get a few years into it, around 1991, the Cold War had ended. And we were at a significantly improved uh, security situation. And so, you know, we looked at our defense and said, hey, the world has gotten safer for us, so we can actually cut back some more. And so that's why we see the continued decline in the defense budget. Um, we're not in that kind of situation now. I don't think anyone would say, hey, all of a sudden the world has gotten much safer for America than it was just a few years ago. Sure, we'll be out of Iraq and Afghanistan, but that doesn't mean that the world is safer and we can... Uh, reduce our military response. All the threats that we saw, you know, post 9/11 are really still out there, uh, in one form or another. Um, so I, I don't think you can say the security environment has significantly improved. Uh, if anything, looking at the future, we're looking at a more challenging security environment going forward. So that's a reason that we might not follow this historical trend because you you know you look at all the threats that are out there uh, and you say, hey, you know, maybe I do need to be making some investments here. Well, to be fair, you could also argue that the perception of the security threat for the past decade has been overblown. You didn't have to go into Iraq. Well, yeah, sure, but you know, the, now that we're out of Iraq, you know, looking at kind of our, if you will, peacetime defense posture, what's changed? Um, you know, between you know 2005, 2006, and now, what has changed? Not a lot. I mean, yeah, we we got Bin Laden, uh, but you know, we still have threats from Al Qaeda affiliated groups around the world. Uh, we see, you know, stuff going on in the Western Pacific. Uh, the Middle East has not gotten more stable. <laughs> it's gotten less stable in many ways. Uh, so, you know, where can we pull back uh, from in the world? It's hard. I wanted to get back to something you mentioned um, in response to Megan's question. The, uh, in the, the past drawdowns, did the, the kind of steepening of the curve come from the administration, or did the Hill pile on on top of that. And yeah, I, you know, did I put this chart in backup? I don't, yeah, I didn't put it in backup, but in the report I've got the, uh, the FIDEF chart. Uh, the, I, sometimes I call it the hairs on the back of the dog, um, where it shows the, the five-year defense program request from each administration uh, compared to what was actually enacted by Congress. And so if you look at it uh, in the 80s drawdown, you see a big difference between what the Reagan administration was projecting and requesting uh, for each budget uh, in their second and the second term of the Reagan administration and what Congress was enacting. So the Reagan administration kept projecting growth in defense spending uh, in the future years while Congress kept cutting the budget and it was cutting it below what the uh, what figure number is that so I can tell people. Page 24. Um, so you know you can see there that the Reagan administration kept projecting growth in the defense budget, and the budget was actually coming down. So Congress was cutting it at that point. Uh, now, that also, um, FY86, uh, we actually had a sequester in defense. Uh, it was about 5% uh, cut in applicable accounts. That started that drawdown uh, in defense spending. Uh, and that was when you know, this, the sequester of awe that we're currently amending, uh, that's when it was originally created. Uh, and it was because of the deficit. So that drawdown really started because of the deficit. Uh, so it's kind of similar situation we're at now. We got record high deficits and we want to get it under control and reduce spending and that's why cutting the defense budget. I mean, DOD is still about half of the discretionary budget. Uh, and so if that's what you're focused on cutting to reduce the deficit, it's hard to do it without cutting defense. So again, back to how could this actually come to pass, this historical trend, if the economy gets worse, Revenues go down, deficit goes up, um, you know, and during a recession or you know, a period of, you know, uh, slow economic growth, you don't want to raise taxes to increase revenues. So you're really, your only other option, if you want to reduce the deficit, is cutting spending. Uh, and it's hard to do that without cutting defense spending.
long term you can cut things like entitlement programs and that'll save you money, but you don't get a lot of near term savings, you know, unless you actually want to cut social security benefits and Medicare benefits for current recipients. If you did that, I don't think you would be back at Congress. Uh, you would not be reelected uh, if you actually did that, but you know, the, the options are kind of limited. So it could be economically driven. Yes. You've argued very well for some relief bells um, all year long, one of them like the Brad, one reforms to Bill Hurt. Where do you stand on acquisition reform and how that how much of a relief valve putting aside whether it's yeah. possible considering there's been three hundred thousand? Yeah, um, acquisition reform like uh, efficiencies is something you should always try to do. We could do a much better job uh, in acquisitions than we currently do. Am I confident that we could actually implement that and make it happen and save a significant amount of money? I'm not. I'm not very optimistic, but I think we should still try. Uh, and there are all kinds of things that Congress could do and the department could do, uh, starting with just you know a, a zero baseline for the acquisition process. Just set the current system aside and try to build a new system from scratch. Don't try to patch the existing system. It has already been patched too many times. It is too complicated. And you know the JSIDS process is a great example. If you look at the big flow chart of the JSIDS process, I encourage you to go Google it. Um, it is just a, a wonderful thing <laughs> to put on your wall and just, wow, now I understand why these programs go over budget and take so long. Um, but I'm not confident we can do it. And this is not something that's unique to DOD. It's not just that DOD is bad at acquiring systems. I mean, all large bureaucracies have these kind of problems. I mean, not to bring up uh, Obamacare, but healthcare.gov, you know, if you're reading about the stories about how they uh, went out and contracted for folks to build this website, um, you know, it was fragmented among so many contractors and subcontractors, each doing a little different part. And the problem again was, you know, the acquisition system itself and the system integration. Uh, and government is not good at that. Uh, they need to get better, uh, but that's not something you can fix overnight. So while I think we ought to absolutely try to tackle this problem and begin work sooner rather than later, it's not going to help your immediate budget problems. It's just not. Uh, it's a long-term reform. We need to begin, kind of like BRAC, uh, except BRAC is a little more straightforward. You just close things and you save money. <laughs> But yeah, acquisition form is something we need to do. The other big reform um, that I, I've pressed in the past and I want to continue to make the point is uh, DOD civilian personnel. And this is in the report, uh, but you know, if you look at the ratio of uh, civilian to military personnel um, and look at it in previous drawdowns, the gray shaded area, um, you can see that you know, the ratio has hovered you know, between you know, a little less than 0.4 uh, up to about 0.5. Um, but in previous drawdowns, the ratio has actually gone up because uh, we have cut uh, you know, military personnel uh, more than we've cut civilian personnel. Um, but uh, you, know, you look at where we are now, and it's going even higher right now. We're at the highest ratio of civilian to military personnel that we've been at in you know, recorded history here since 1948. You know, we've got the ratio now is 0.57. Um, so that's something I think we've got to, to deal with within the defense budget. As we you know, draw down the size of the military, as is already planned and as will probably become necessary uh, as the budget declines in the future, we've got to make sure we draw down the civilian workforce in proportion. I think that's one thing that the skimmer uh, was lacking in is a specific proposal on how to do that across the services. The skimmer said they're going to reduce about 20% of headquarters staffs at the OSD level and, and perhaps the combatant commands. Um, that's the tip of the iceberg. Uh, the vast majority uh, of your uh, DOD civilian workforce is in the services and they're not in the Pentagon. They're not in the DC area. I think about 85% of your civilian employees are outside of DC. So they're scattered all over the country in the services budgets. Uh, and I think that's something that each of the services are gonna have to get a hold of and make sure they have the right size and the right composition in their civilian workforce. Is this chart here uh, average cost per civilian and, and constant dollars? Yes, it is. I'm sorry, this, I didn't put that on there. I should have. Yes, this is an FY14 constant dollars. So yeah, so you can see the cost per civilian has gone up as well. It is, did not go up as fast as military personnel costs. Um, part of the reason these costs went up 
uh, and the gray shaded area in the middle in the past drawdown, while we were reducing the number of DOD civilian personnel, and McKenzie Eaglin has done some good work on this at AEI, uh, you look at the mix of workers, and we tended to keep the higher ranking white collar uh, workers, and the reductions were more focused on blue collar workers who tend to make less. So the cost per person that remained actually went up uh, because you've got a, a different mix of people. They tend to be more uh, white collar workers that are paid more. Uh, and now we have a similar issue that you, you look at um, the you know, years of service of our civilian workforce, and a lot of people are, are approaching retirement eligibility. Um, so they're pretty far up there in that pay scale. If you do something like a reduction in force and you look at the current rules in effect about how you do a RIF, that's basically laying off DOD civilian employees, uh, DOD's hands are tied in how they can do that. I think there are four factors they have to take into account when figuring out who to lay off in a RIF. Uh, and the number one uh, factor is tenure. Uh, so people who have served longer get protected in a RIF. And your junior people, the people who just came in, who are less expensive, are the first ones to go. Um, so it's a, a last in, first out system. Of the four factors, uh, the one that is given the least weight is merit, performance. <laughs> uh, I think most Americans would think that we got our priorities reversed there, um, that we should be you know, first laying off people who are poor performers, regardless of their tenure. Um, but uh, I think the unions uh, that represent these folks might disagree. It's a familiar principle to every school district in the country. Yes, yeah. I mean, the <laughs> DOD is not unique. Other parts of government, state and local level, have same issues. Um, but you know, that's something that we could do right away. The, Congress could reform the way the, uh, the RIF process works uh, and allow DOD to basically reshape their workforce uh, by perhaps jettisoning some of the folks who are lower performers who also might have higher tenure and be higher paid. Uh, and that's the way you can bring down your average cost per civilian. And I think you know, they're going to have to resort to something like this uh, in the next year if sequestration stays into effect. I mean, they can do furloughs again, but furloughs are a temporary fix. It saves you money in that first year, but you're right back up uh, to your personnel costs, your civilian personnel costs once the new fiscal year begins and the furloughs are over. Um, you haven't fixed the problem long term. The long term problem is you've got to reduce headcount. Civil service reform, we need to do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, if, if, if they could just give DOD the ability, uh, the flexibility to make these reductions in civilian workforce in a more rational manner instead of following this last in, first out uh, policy, um, that would be a big improvement. And the last in, first out policy is a reason you hear some senior DOD officials saying that they don't want to do a RIF. Because if you're a you know, new you know, DASD or undersecretary or assistant secretary or something, you come into office, you're only going to be there a few years, you bring in a few folks, really smart, bright, motivated people uh, that you handpicked, uh, and now those are the first people you have to let go if you do a RIF. And so that's why a lot of senior managers push back and say, I don't want to do a RIF because I'm going to be getting rid of some of the you know, most talented people I just brought in. Yes. Um, you seem to be saying at the, at the close of the report that if you had one piece of advice to give DOD, it would be to plan better. In other words, more realistically, given the current fiscal situation, is that an accurate? That that is, and you know, I one piece of advice. Yeah, the biggest piece of advice, if anyone was listening, and I don't expect them to, <laughs> um, but you know, the, the biggest thing DOD could do right now is seize the opportunity they have in the FY15 budget development, and they're already they're part of the way there. They are developing an FY15 budget that ignores sequester and an FY15 budget that takes into account the sequester level budget caps. Um, I think the, the best thing they could do at this point to get ahead of the curve on this and start making rational reductions uh, in the force instead of these you know, uh, irrational sequester cuts is propose a 15 budget that fits within the budget caps. There is no good indication that those budget caps are going to be relieved for FY15. They stayed in effect for 2013. You know, irregardless of how much DOD protested uh, and how, you know, how many times generals went up on the hill and said these are going to be dire, this will be devastating, the FY13 sequester cuts uh, remained in effect. FY14, I think we're headed for the same situation. DOD did not submit a budget in FY14 that fits within the caps, so they are still unprepared for this. 
Um, although it looks like they're slowing down spending early this year. They didn't do that last year, so that will help. Uh, but FY15 is a chance to get ahead of the curve, plan for the cuts, plan for the worst, hope for the best. Uh, and you're doing a QDR at the same time. You got your 2014 QDR that they're working in parallel. Uh, that is a great chance to go back to the 2012 Defense Strategic Guidance and say, what are, what are the real priorities? What are the things we must do? Uh, and what are the things that we just can't afford to do and we have to let go? What are the low priorities? And present that to Congress as a package and say, look, you've given us budget constraints. Here's how we would live within it. Here's how we would adjust our strategy accordingly. Uh, you know, and people will call that a budget-driven strategy. Well, you know, guess what? Strategy should be budget-constrained uh, budget constrained because a strategy that's not constrained by, uh, you know, realistic budget and resource availability is no strategy at all because you can't execute it. Uh, in fact, if you don't have budget constraints, you don't need a strategy. You can just do more of everything. Why not a million-man army or two million? Or why not start 10 F-35 programs or whatever? You know, buy a thousand ships. If you've got no resource constraints, you don't need a strategy. You can just do everything. Um, but, you know, in the real world, we always have budget constraints. Even in the past decade, we did have budget constraints. They were looser. Uh, we had a you know, growing budget. Now, as the constraints on the defense budget start to get tighter, strategy becomes more important. And so they've got to formulate a strategy to live within those constraints, present that to Congress, and then that gives Congress a fair choice, something to debate, something real, not hyperbole, not vague general notions uh, and, you know, not any kind of trickery or anything. Show them what we could do within these budget constraints. And then Congress can make a, a thoughtful, deliberative decision. Are we okay with that? Are we okay with this strategy and this kind of force posture and the way that, you know, we would, uh, you know, fulfill or not fulfill our security commitments around the world? If you're okay with it, you can stay at those budget levels. If you're not okay with it, give the department more, they can do more. Um, but right now, we can't have that debate because uh, the department has not presented, uh, you know, that kind of a, a strategy and a budget that fits within the budget caps. All right. Any other questions? If not, thank you all for coming. Uh, and, you know, the webcast will be available online as well as the report and the slides. So thank you all. Next time. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Enjoy it.